This is an independent dialogue for the United Nations Food Systems Summit, linking uh, metabolic health and nutrition as a fundamental uh, piece for tackling chronic disease and changing the food system. Uh, we're highlighting uh, a few point, key points today, connecting the dots between metabolic health, good food, and metabolism, uh, and uh, also pointing to this connection as being fundamental in creating uh, structural changes, not only in our personal health, but in our uh, food system. I'm pleased to uh, be your host today, along with our, uh, my co-convener, uh, Roberta Ruggiero, who is founder and president of the Hypoglycemia Support Foundation and has run the organization for over 40 years. Um, myself, uh, Wolfram Alderson, I've been working at the intersection of food and health and environment for also over 40 years and pleased to serve as uh, CEO of the Hypoglycemia Support Foundation. And today I'm joined by my esteemed, esteemed colleagues and experts. I'll just give a brief introduction uh, to each of you um, and please help me if I miss anything. Um, uh, Vivi Subramanian, or Subra as we uh, know him more affectionately, um, is uh, Vice President and Chief Business Officer for KDD. He has a, is a mechanical engineer and also holds an MBA. Uh, Dr. Lustig um, ha has a medical degree as well as a degree in law, uh, is also an author and Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics and Endocrinology at um, UCSF. Uh, then we have uh, Dr. Tim Harlan, who is also an MD, was an award-winning chef before he became an MD, is Associate Professor of Medicine at George Washington, and um, is, uh, runs one of the largest culinary medicine programs in the United States, maybe anywhere in the world, also an author. Uh, Dr. Gal uh, is a neuropsychologist. She holds a PhD and is also a registered nutritionist and also an author, has a new book out as well. And Dr. Kornstadt, uh, last but not least, is holds a PhD in computer informatics and is founder and CEO of a company called Perfect. All right, so welcome. And so uh, let's just start off with each of you giving your own definition. There's no wrong answer here. What is metabolic health as opposed to metabolic disease? We hear a lot about the disease, but what is your personal idea of what metabolic health is? And we'll start off with Dr. Gao. Hi, everyone. So metabolic health um, can be broadly and translationally outlined as feeding the gut, protecting the liver, and supporting the brain. Great. And Roberta? Well, um, to me, uh, metabolic health or metabolism affects the whole body. Um, every organ, every system, every cell. But my focus is basically on blood sugar health or blood sugar um, because being hypoglycemic, which is low blood sugar, my goal is to uh, avoid the blood sugar um, roller coaster. So um, blood sugar health is, is my main focus. Thank you. And Dr. Harlan? Well, I think the foundations of metabolic health stem out of food, and I'm a food guy first and foremost. And so for me, it means accessible, great quality, great tasting food that just happens to be great for you. Great. And Supra? Yes. Hello, everyone. To me, if there's one commonality among consumers in all parts of the world, it is that they want to be healthy and happy. And I see this as a combination of physical and mental well-being. And I believe that metabolic health is directly related to physical well-being, which in turn influences mental well-being. So whether I'm happy or grumpy really depends on how my bodily processes are working. So that's my short answer for metabolic health. Thank you. And Dr. Kornstadt. Well, I cannot add to the medical um, explanation here, but I think um, it's not just a theoretical concept that we know what to do, but that metabolic health is really metabolic health 
implemented so it really reaches um, every consumer everywhere. Great, I'm saving Dr. Lustig for last. So I'll give my definition, which is I, I, I understand that metabolic health has to do with the making as well as the uh, deconstruction of all cells in the body. So I like to think of metabolic health as taking care of every cell in my body. And then Dr. Lustig, last but not least, we save you for last because we, we anticipate you might have one of the richest answers for us. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I believe that metabolic health is the intersection between biology and environment that promotes optimal growth and nutrition for the organism. Great. Uh, well, thank you for that. And so the question of the day, you know, wh why are we talking about metabolic health and nutrition? And what is this um, metabolic matrix uh, that's, that's been presented? Um, for those who are uh, watching this program, uh, we're referring to an article and a paper that was published on the World Economic Forum platform um, and is available. We'll, we'll make sure that when we post this uh, talk, uh, we'll share the links. Um, there was both an article and a paper uh, uh, describing the work that's going on at KDD. Um, they're highlighted right here. And again, we'll, we'll share the links. Um, but this has gotten a lot of attention, and uh, we're really going to try to fill in um, uh, some of the topics and ideas that were presented in this paper and the work that's going on at um, KDD, based in Kuwait. Um, so why are we interested in these concepts? I mean, uh, uh, why are they being presented? So first of all, why has KDD uh, gotten into this business, into this work? Uh, Super, we'd love to hear the perspective uh, from KDD. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Wolfram. So KDD is a 100% Kuwaiti company that has been in the business of dairy, fruit juices, ice creams, and culinary products for almost 60 years now. And the brand and its products are very popular because of very strong consumer loyalty. And such loyalty is built based on the credibility of the brand. So our consumers expect only the best from KDD and they truly believe that we offer it to them. And therefore on our part as a producer, we have been very mindful of this fact and hence we always try to source the finest ingredients and invest in modern technology and processes. But there are a few pertinent questions that we have been asking and trying to deal with. We want our products to be really healthy, staying true to our motto of uh, pure wholesome goodness. But what does nutritious and healthy actually mean? Why is our population here among the highest globally in obesity and diabetes? Now, are these markers to a deeper and larger problem and not a problem in themselves? Are there many confusing definitions of what it means to eat healthy food? And are consumers not being guided or motivated enough through the declarations that appear on the packs? Say, for example, the traffic lights. And why are we seeing problems of hypertension, cardiovascular illnesses and the like? even in youngsters, and is all the spend on healthcare going to stay on the rise? Now, any of these health issues could be a result of, or a combination of food, lifestyle, and probably even genetics. But being a food producer, we were prompted by such questions to seek the most appropriate definition for nutritious and healthy. And so in working with a team of experts, such as Dr. Lastig and the others, we realized a very simple truth that we are not what we eat, but what we metabolize. But the science of metabolism is best left to the experts on this panel to explain. But to us, it meant simplifying the science of metabolism into actionable steps that could promise health and nutrition through our products. And this paradigm, inspired by Dr. Lustig's work, is threefold. Protect the liver, feed the gut, and support the brain. Now, since the time we have defined 
healthy and nutrition or nutritious in this manner, we have also evolved detailed criteria and have been keenly evaluating our portfolio to steer it towards maximum positive nutrition. We firmly believe that this definition of health and nutrition that we have now takes out all ambiguity regarding fats, sugars, proteins, calories, and focuses on key factors that are responsible for healthy metabolism in our bodies and on what harm food, particularly processed food, should not cause. Because ultimately that's what we wish for our consumer, you know, to stay healthy and to be happy. So that's what is our endeavor now. And that's the journey that we have started. Well, thank you. Um, I'm, I've been working in food system change since I was a teenager over 40 years. And honestly, uh, much of my career, it's been about uh, you know boycotts and complaining about what's wrong and marching around with signs and really working very hard to try to get the attention of companies in the food and beverage industry. And so it's really remarkable, actually astounding that uh, KDD is taking this, um, this challenge on and really the, the amazing uh, scientific uh, approach to doing this. It's, uh, it's truly uh, remarkable and uh, notable on a global scale. So thank you. Um, the, the next question is to Roberta and the Hypoglycemia Support Foundation. Why is a, a, a non-governmental organization or a nonprofit uh, such as the Hypoglycemia Support Foundation interested in this work? Roberta, would you just share some thoughts? Sure, Wolfram, thank you so much. First of all, I wanna thank you and everybody here um, to include me. I feel very honored and very privileged um, in order to answer the question, I have to first say, why do we have the Hypoglycemia Support Foundation? Very quickly, very simply, I founded it almost 40 years ago. As a result of my personal experiences, I was sick for 10 years. No one can figure out what was wrong with me. I came to a point where I was mentally and emotionally, uh, physically unable to, um, to function and even thoughts of suicide. By this time, I was ready to give up. It wasn't until a doctor in 1973 looked at my records and suggested that I take a, a glucose tolerance test. He came back and told me, or basically asked me a question that nobody ever did ask before, what do I eat? And at that point, I thought, oh my God, this guy is crazy, it's not me. Well, anyway, he said I had a severe case of functional hypoglycemia and what I needed to stabilize my condition and to feel better after 10 years was a diet. And I just couldn't believe it. So I started to investigate what was I eating, you know, or, or not eating. And what I came across was something that was pure, white and deadly. And its name was sugar. So when I realized that, it took me years to really uh, change my diet from an Italian background, eating a lot of sugar, carbs. Um, it was a challenge, but I did it. And people heard about my story. And that's basically why I formed the Hypoglycemia Support Foundation. And what happened to me almost 40 years ago, unfortunately, is still happening today. We get calls and letters from all over the world, India, Africa, Pakistan. I have hypoglycemia. They tell me to change my diet, get off of sugar, you know, high carbs. How do I do it? When I go shopping, every single thing has sugar in it, even those that are, you know, supposed to be natural from juice, yogurt, um, you know, you name it, the list could go on. So when I came, um, when I met Wolfram five years ago, this was our dream, you know, because as a consumer advocate, especially for the Hypoglycemia Support Foundation, we can educate these people. We could give them hope. We could give them support. We could give them even love. But that's not the that that's not doing it. We have to change the system. 
And that's why we're here today to announce KDD, that it's just almost like a miracle that a, a company of that caliber would come forth and, and start changing the system. So um, I, I can say how excited I am and how privileged I feel to be here today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roberto. Well, uh, now we're just gonna jump in. Um, we've, we've heard uh, you know, why we're here and we've heard this perspective from uh, KDD and why they're involved in this work why uh, nonprofit organizations and consumers and, and patients are interested in this work. But let's understand the science. What is this metabolic matrix? What, is, uh, um, what, what, is, what are the pillars of this work? And we'll start with uh, Dr. Tim Harlan, who's gonna focus on uh, the first pillar, which is feed the gut. Dr. Harlan. Thanks, Wolfram. So you know, as uh, Dr. Gal mentioned, this triad of feed the gut, uh, support the brain, uh, et cetera, uh, impact the liver begins with our gut. And as Dr. Lustig said, you know, uh, about that intersection of biology and environment, well, the gut is that primary intersection between biology and environment that's so important. It is first and foremost an organ, and the issue for us today is the balance between the consumption of unprocessed whole foods and ultra-processed foods, oftentimes in our, uh, in our world today, containing a lot of sugar. The challenge uh, is what we feed our gut, not only in that it sets up that gut-to-liver uh, access and the gut brain access that you're going to hear about uh, a little later, but also what we feed our gut can damage the gut directly, but also create derangements in our microbiome and the gut bacteria that we live symbiotically with. Next slide. So the di digestion takes place, it's pretty simple, uh, inside the gastrointestinal tract, starting with mechanical breakdown of the foods that we eat in the stomach. Next slide. And the, the stomach is, uh, that's been broken down, or the, the food that's been broken down in the stomach into individual micro, macronutrients and micronutrients, say protein, carbohydrates, fats, uh, et cetera, is then passed into the small intestine for absorption. And then the third part of this next slide is the end result of that digestion, uh, that digestion process is individual molecules that are small enough that the nutrients can be absorbed as well as passed around the body for metabolism, especially again, by the liver and by the brain. And this process in the, primarily in the small intestine is a very important part of the gut brain access uh, that Dr. Gao is going to speak about later. Next slide. So it's really in many ways rather simple, you know, feeding the gut the best quality foods can improve our health outcomes through optimal immune system functioning as well as enhancing gene expression. The interesting thing is that people don't really consider the gut as an organ, but when you do begin looking at, as, uh, looking at it as an organ, it creates and, and has more serotonin receptors, for example, than the brain does. It, it's, it accounts for about 70% of our immune system interaction with the outside world, that biology uh, versus environment axis uh, that Dr. Lustig mentioned. Next slide, please. One of the biggest problems is that we refine uh, whole foods, um, whether that's you know wheat products or sugar products. Uh, we spend a lot of time refining, and for example, whole grains uh, in, uh, are refined into white flour to make our breads and pastas. And the really important part of that terrific whole grain. Uh, is the germ and the bran, which are removed, and that strips most of the nutritional content away from the grain itself. And so feeding the gut 
these uh, similarly highly processed sugars as one might with the highly processed white flour, including high fructose corn syrup, uh, as well as artificial stabilizers, preservatives, emulsifiers, are what leads to the direct damage of the gut. Next slide, please. But importantly, that, uh, that poor quality ultra processed food also delays gastric, um, will, will speed gastric emptying because the additional fiber delays ga gastric em emptying, which helps regulate bowel function, increases satiety, but also helps modulate how blood sugar is uh, controlled in the body itself. Next slide. So there's, you know, a couple of, there's been a lot of studies about this. This is uh, one published in the Lancet that looked at how critical fiber is, um, you, you know, and, and its relationship to preventing cancers, regulating blood glucose levels, uh, but also, as I mentioned, keeping you full after you eat. Uh, additionally, Studies have shown that fiber, uh, saw increased amounts of soluble fiber that we consume helps lower LDL or the bad cholesterol, thus helping prevent atherosclerosis. The next slide. And this is, this is really typified in a great study that, that uh, compared a good quality, high fiber, whole foods diet with a, a, um, a lower fat, but also more processed carbohydrate diet. And you can see that these, the two curves here in the ADA diet, that the blood sugar was modulated. The lower curve uh, in both of these graphs is the um, amount of glucose in the top graph and the amount of insulin in the bottom graph. And in both cases, the higher fiber diet blunted the amount of uh, glucose circulating in the bloodstream, but also consequently helped blunt the amount of insulin. And that, that hyperinsulinemia or that excess insulin production is part of what leads to some of the issues that Dr. Lustig is gonna talk about in a moment. Next slide, please. And so one key is that you've heard me say over and over is that ultra processed food promotes uh, damage to the gut, but it also uh, promotes unhealthy gut bacteria. And in doing a number of things like dis disrupting this mucus layer, there's this layer that protects the gut. Uh, it, 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 again, it damages the gut, uh, but also leads to poor quality uh, gut microbiota or the, the gut bacteria that we have this terrific symbiotic relationship. And uh, the next slide, please. Because there is a, a very complicated bidirectional relationship between that intestinal, those intestinal bacteria and their host. Uh, and, and it's clearly very vital to our health. And while the field is evolving, our growth in the understanding of the relationship is that it's very important to maximizing human health. Uh, it's going to lead not only to the understanding of disease, but will also lead to, we think, a very important therapeutic approaches. And by offering products that feed the gut with healthy, unprocessed ingredients, including soluble fiber, insoluble fiber, probiotics that are low in sugars, especially low in fructose, as you'll find, uh, then the food industry becomes a prevention strategy for the health of their patrons. And I'll pass it back to you, Wolfram. Thank you, uh, Tim. Thank you. And that's, uh, we're, we're saving our questions and dialogue to the end, folks. So uh, we will be um, uh, digging a little deeper into some, and making some comments and questions for each of the speakers today. We'll continue with uh, Dr. Lessig, who is focusing on uh, protecting the liver. Dr. Lustig. Thank you, Wolfram. So I think it's kind of uh, obvious to say that we are in the midst of the worst health care crisis in the history of mankind. And it is both a chronic health care crisis and an acute health care crisis. And wouldn't it be good if we could find 
a single thing that could help solve both. Well, I'm here to tell you that ultra processed food is the driver of chronic disease. And it is also the thing that makes you most susceptible to acute disease, including our current coronavirus pandemic. I will also say that the corollary to that is you cannot solve healthcare until you solve health. You cannot solve health until you solve diet. And you cannot solve diet until you know what is wrong. And we have been barking up the wrong tree for the last 50 years in terms of demonizing fat. In fact, what we need to do is protect the liver. And we have not been doing that. Instead, we have been flooding the liver and the liver has been getting sick. Witness the increase in fatty liver disease all over the world, and particularly in children. Fatty liver disease used to be the disease of alcohol. It is now the disease of five-year-olds. And the reason is because five-year-olds do not drink alcohol, but boy, oh boy, do they consume sugar. So let me show you how this works on the next slide, please. So people think this is about obesity. Yes, if you get obese, you get sick. Well, that is true for 80% of the obese. But in the first frame on the left, you will notice an obese person. But I want you to take a look in the red circle at this person's liver. This is a low liver fat at 2.6%, which is perfectly normal. This is what we call metabolically healthy obese, or MHO. This person will live a completely normal life, die at a completely normal age, not cost the taxpayer a dime or a kroner or a drachma or any other um, uh, uh, monetary currency that you'd like. All right. And the reason is because this person has a healthy liver, because this person has had his liver protected. Now, in the middle, you will see what would be more most like more common, and that is an obese person, but now with a significant amount of fat in the liver, 24% in this case. So this person is metabolically ill. And finally, let's look at the third person on the right. Notice thin, but take a look at that liver, 23%. So what we have is thin sick on the right, fat sick in the middle, and fat healthy on the left. And what this demonstrates to us is it's not the fat you can see that counts, it's the fat you cannot, and particularly the fat in the liver, which drives chronic metabolic disease because it drives a phenomenon called insulin resistance, and that drives a phenomenon called mitochondrial dysfunction. And when your mitochondria don't work, you can't burn. Next slide. So the big question is what causes this fatty liver? How does it occur and how can we turn it around? Next slide. Well, the uh, compound sugar, dietary sugar, sucrose, high fructose corn syrup, maple syrup, honey, agave, doesn't matter, is composed of two molecules. One is called glucose, one is called fructose. Glucose metabolism is uh, demarcated on the left, fructose metabolism is demarcated on the right. And while I will not take you through all of these arrows, it's not necessary. The only point I'm trying to make here is that these two molecules are not the same. Glucose, when it enters the liver, virtually all of it will end up in a storage form called glycogen, which is why marathoners carb load before a race. Glycogen is non-toxic. Glycogen basically helps protect the liver. And so glucose, for lack of a better word, is safe. Conversely, take a look at the right side. You'll notice that fructose does not go to glycogen. Fructose is also not insulin regulated at the level of the pancreas. Fructose goes down to the mitochondria, overwhelms the mitochondria, throws off excess citrate, as you can see in uh, just above the mitochondria, and that citrate ends up becoming the substrate for developing liver fat, which is there denoted as a lipid droplet and triglyceride.
It is that lipid droplet and that triglyceride that leads to diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia, and virtually all of the other chronic diseases that we know. So the glucose is not the problem. Unfortunately, with dietary sugar, the glucose comes packaged already with a problematic payload called fructose. And it is that fructose molecule that is particularly egregious in terms of metabolic health. Next slide. This has been shown by several investigators, including ourselves. In fact, fructose inhibits mitochondria. Mitochondria are the little energy burning factories inside everyone's cells. And the faster those mitochondria burn, the more energy the cell makes. However, fructose actually inhibits mitochondrial function. And it does so by inhibiting three, count them, three separate enzymes that are necessary for normal mitochondrial and therefore normal metabolic functioning and metabolic health. Those three enzymes are listed on the top. One is called AMP kinase, which turns on mitochondria. The second is called acyl-CoA dehydrogenase long chain. This is what allows mitochondria to burn fat in the first place. And the third one is called carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1. This is the uh, shuttle that gets fat into the mitochondria for burning. I will mention that I am not the only one who believes this. This quote from the president of the Joslin Diabetes Center at Harvard, Dr. Ron Kahn, the most important takeaway of this study is that high fructose in the diet is bad. It's not bad because it's more calories, but because it has effects on liver metabolism to make it worse at burning fat. As a result, adding fructose to the diet makes the liver store more fat, and this is bad for the liver and bad for whole body metabolism. I couldn't agree more. Next slide. We at UCSF, my parent institution, took 43 children with fatty liver disease and metabolic syndrome. And what we did was we studied them on their home diet and found, of course, that they were turning sugar into fat at great, uh, 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 very rapid rates and were uh, spilling triglycerides into the bloodstream. We then put them on a sugar restricted diet for nine days. We took away the fructose from their diet. Now, if you do this, you're going to lose about 400 calories a day. And if that happens, then the patient might lose weight. We didn't want them to lose weight. We wanted them to stay the same weight. So we had to replace the fructose with something that had the same number of calories. We gave them extra glucose. So we did a glucose for fructose exchange for 10 days, and then we studied them again. And what we noticed was that their liver fat disappeared. Their turning uh, sugar into liver fat went down by half. Their triglycerides went down by 46%. Their belly fat went down by 7%. Next slide. And their pancreas started making insulin properly, thus reversing the disease, the metabolic syndrome. In other words, we were able to reverse these children's metabolic syndrome just by getting the sugar out of their diet and replacing it with starch. Can you imagine how much better they would have been if we hadn't replaced them with starch? Next slide. In addition, uh, another investigator group uh, just found found that fructose has a specific effect on intestinal um, uh, absorption capacity by actually growing the um, uh, uh, specialized uh, um, organelles in the intestine that absorb a food called villi and allow for increased uh, carbohydrate and increased fat to be absorbed and then flood the liver and cause disease. Next slide. So the question is, if fructose is part of the problem, if not the entire problem, what can one do? Well, one has to reduce total sugar intake. That, of course, is very difficult, next slide, to do in our current environment. 
And the reason is because it is in all of the ultra processed food. It is the thing that makes us eat ultra processed food. 56% of the food sold in America is ultra processed, and it accounts for 62% of the sugar in the American diet and 67% of sugar in kids' diets. And you can see from this pie chart that it is in virtually everything. We always talk about the beverages and we talk about the cake, cookie, candy, ice cream uh, categories, but in fact, it's in everything. And this is part of the problem. So this requires a complete rehaul, uh, overhaul of how food is prepared in, uh, in, uh, to, to achieve metabolic health. Next slide. And I actually published this um, op-ed in The Guardian uh, a couple of years ago. Sugar is the alcohol of the child. In fact, because alcohol and fructose are metabolized virtually identically and both lead to fatty liver disease and metabolic syndrome. But unfortunately, we let it dominate the breakfast table because of breakfast cereal, because of orange juice, et cetera. And so these are our targets in terms of trying to improve metabolic health for children. Next slide. So how can we do this? Well, there are several ways. One is get rid of the sugar, but there are other things one can do. So we can reduce glycemic load. Next slide. Now, what is glycemic load? It is a proxy for the insulin response. Okay, the goal is to keep the insulin down because insulin in itself drives chronic metabolic disease. So when we talk about metabolic health, we have to be talking about a low insulin diet. And this was shown by an Israeli group who actually looked at the glucose and therefore the insulin responses of a whole host of subjects and found that each person's insulin response was different from everyone else's and that each person's insulin response to different foods was different from everyone else's. But there were certain precepts that they could take away. And one of them was that uh, uh, glycemic load was a, uh, 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 a factor in terms of keeping insulin down. Next slide. So, there are different foods that will give you different glucose and therefore insulin responses. For instance, white bread will raise your blood glucose very high, as you can see in red, whereas beans will keep your blood glucose from spiking because of the fiber in the beans. So people talk about glycemic index being important. There are two problems with glycemic index. One is explained by carrots. So carrots are high glycemic index. If you eat 50 grams of carbohydrate in carrots, your blood glucose will spike pretty high. However, carrots are good for you anyway. And the reason is because how many carrots do you have to eat to get those 50 grams? It turns out you have to eat 700 grams of carrots. You have to eat 1.4 pounds of carrots. And no one can, except maybe Bugs Bunny. So <laughs> the fact is that Carrots are low glycemic load because they are almost entirely fiber. And this goes back to what Dr. Harlan was talking about, is feeding the gut with fiber to reduce the glycemic response. The other problem with glycemic index is that fructose, the sweet molecule in sugar, because it doesn't generate a glucose response, it's considered low glycemic index. It doesn't matter because fructose effects have nothing to do with glycemic index. It has to do with flooding the liver, not flooding the bloodstream. And therefore, it doesn't matter. So the concept of glycemic index has to be discarded in favor of a high fiber concept. Next slide. And this shows that the glucose excursion that Dr. Harlan showed you with a high fiber diet actually approximates that of a low carbohydrate diet on the right. So in fact, you can eat in multiple ways. So it's not that you have to eat a low carb diet. It's not that you have to eat a vegan diet. The fact is what you have to eat is a high fiber diet in order to maintain a low blood glucose and therefore a low blood insulin. 
And so this is one of the cornerstones of protecting the liver in metabolic health. Next slide. In addition, people talk about hydration. This is one of the subterfuges of the sports drink industry. And that's why they have to add carbohydrate to sports drinks. Next slide. So if you take the, uh, if you look at the usual thinking about maintaining hydration, they will say that you need carbohydrate to re regulate your fluid uptake, and you need sodium for volume and osmolality, and these are necessary for effective hydration. I would uh, pose that this is actually not necessary. Next slide. In fact, it has now been shown that the reason hydration works is because it actually blocks a specific receptor on the liver, which is turning fructose into fat. And that receptor is called the vasopressin 1B receptor. <clears throat> so in fact, hydration is important, but putting carbohydrate or salt for that matter in the hydration is actually not important. So this is, you know, turns the whole concept of hydration on its head and, you know, uh, is much more consistent with our uh, concept of metabolic health. Next slide. And lastly, we have to reduce environmental toxins reaching the liver. And as Dr. Harlan told you, the intestine is the gateway into the body and 70% of all of the immune uh, phenomena that go on in our body are in the intestine. And it's because the intestine is the first um, uh, uh, organ to see most of what we are exposed to because it's in our food. Next slide. Now the intestine regulates what comes into our body through proteins in the intestine known as tight junctions, also known as zonulins. And they form a barrier that prevents bacteria, lipopolysaccharides, cytokines that are in the intestinal lumen from reaching into our bloodstream, thus protecting the liver. But those tight junctions can be disrupted. They can be made dysfunctional through various things, some of them in our uh, in our diets that have to do with, say, uh, uh, foreign bacteria or viruses, but also some of the things that are in food. Next slide. One of the things that disrupts that, of course, is that molecule fructose, because it actually causes changes in those tight junction proteins that we just talked about that leads to a phenomenon called leaky gut which allows for the translocation of bacteria and lipopolysaccharides into the bloodstream, thus reaching the liver and setting up liver inflammation, which drives chronic metabolic disease. So in each case, keeping the liver healthy and protecting the liver from the onslaught of substrates that are in food and substrates that are in the intestine that lead to liver dysfunction is the primary goal. Ultra-processed food, unfortunately, floods the liver instead of protecting it. And so ultra-processed food is the problem because ultra-processed food is high sugar, low fiber. And this is what we and KDD are striving to turn around. Great. Thank you, Dr. Lessig. Um, there's so much to chew on there, literally and figuratively, but we will hold our questions till the end and uh, proceed with uh, Dr. Gao. Um, thank you. So my contribution is to share a little bit about how we can support the brain. Next slide, thank you. <clears throat> The role of nutrition in the human brain has gained much attention via the emergence of multidisciplinary scientific fields of research, including nutritional psychiatry and nutritional neuroscience, which ultimately seek to better understand nutrition's impact on cognition and brain health across the lifespan. Next slide. <clears throat> So what is your brain made of? The brain is the fattest organ in the human body. Around 65% of the dry weight of the adult brain 
and retina is made up of complex, specialized and unique fats called lipids. And approximately 25% of all neuronal membranes are made up of a highly unsaturated fatty acid called docosahexaenoic acid, also known as DHA. It is estimated that the human brain has in the region of around 100 billion neurons. And each, well, omega-3 DHA coats each one of these neurons um, <clears throat> called the myelin sheath. And basically the myelin sheath acts as an insulator and contributes to faster and more efficient cell signaling across our brain's networks. Omega-3, DHA, and eicosapentaenoic acid, also known as EPA, also play an important role in the regulation of our brain's happy hormone, namely serotonin, and the hormone which enables us to feel pleasure, motivated, and rewarded, namely dopamine. Um, next slide, thank you. So there's no doubt that omega-3s are brain essential. They perform critical, uh, significant biological functions throughout the central nervous system. They especially play a role in early cortical maturation, in neuro and synaptogenesis, in gene expression, in cell signaling, as I've just mentioned, in myelination, neuronal migration, and many other complex functions. So how do we ensure an adequate intake of both EPA and DHA? Well, we need to be consuming at least two portions of oily fish and seafood, such as wild Alaskan salmon, mackerel, pilchard, sardines, rainbow trout, and seafood such as shrimp and oysters. We should be aiming for at least 500 milligrams of combined EPA and DHA per day. Next slide, please. The head of the omega-3 family is alpha-linoleic acid, also known as ALA, which can be obtained um, from certain nuts, seeds, and green leafy vegetables. It's a plant-based, short-chain, polyunsaturated fatty acid. However, the conversion process from ALA to EPA and DHA is highly complex and problematic, and therefore a direct source of these two key highly unsaturated fatty acids from marine fish or algae is strongly recommended. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so essentially the balance of omega-3 and six in the brain is critical, and I'm just going to explain uh, a little bit about why that is. So essentially the average person following a Western type diet is consuming around 20 times the amount of omega-6 compared to omega-3. And therefore the ratio and intake of omega-6 to omega-3 is in balance, when it should be around four to one or optimally one to one. And an imbalance can result in inflammation in the body and brain. And there is a general consensus among those working in the field of nutritional psychiatry that underlying much of mental illness and poor brain health is inflammation. Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory, whereas omega-6s are pro-inflammatory. Next slide. So the head of the omega-6 family is linoleic acid which is widely present in all commercially available ultra-processed supermarket foods in the form of soybean oil, which is illustrated in this picture. So the omega-6 linoleic acid competes with omega-3 for desaturation and elongation and competes for space in the body and our neuronal membranes. The uh, omega-6 arachidonic acid is a precursor to inflammatory prostanoids and leukotrienes, which play a significant role in depression and other psychiatric diseases. So it's important to consider when adding the omega-3s, EPA and DHA into the diet, that they will be competing against a very large backdrop of the omega-6 linoleic acid. 
And this is especially so in those following a Western type diet who are consuming on average 12 to 17 grams of omega-6 every single day. There's no doubt we need arachidonic acid. It's our body's response to injury. It creates inflammation, sending a signal to alert us we need to tend to a wound. However, increased and chronic inflammation in our body and brain increases risk for poor brain health as well as physical disease. Next slide, please. So omega-3s are absolutely critical during pregnancy and therefore the quality of the maternal diet is super important. Omega-3s can be thought of, sorry, if you like, as the building blocks of the baby's brain and retina. In fact, there is a preferential uptake of omega-3s across the placenta during the last trimester of pregnancy via a process called biomagnification, which continues during the first 18 months of life via the transfer of human milk by the mother. We know that babies born prematurely are at risk or have an increased risk rather of conditions such as global developmental delay, dyslexia, ADHD, premature retinopathy, and so on. Next slide, please. So omega-3s are critical throughout the lifespan and there are a plethora of studies available uh, on PubMed, but one recent one published in the Nutritional Cognitive Neuroscience Journal in 2015 found that omega-3s show potential as a nutritional therapy to prevent dysfunction in the aging brain. We know from epidemiological longitudinal studies that those following a Mediterranean diet rich in nuts, seeds, green leafy vegetables, oily fish, extra virgin, cold press, um, olive oil have lower rates of physical disease, cognitive decline, um, depression, and not only that, those following this dietary pattern have increased longevity. In other words, they live longer. Next slide. <clears throat> there is a wealth of clinical trial data showing that early dietary intervention with DHA results in improved cognitive development in children, improved visual acuity, improvements in the ability to problem solve, improvements in literacy, including spelling and reading games, and improvements in sleep, as well as reductions in clinical symptoms of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, next slide, please. As mentioned earlier, one of the key mechanistic actions of the omega-3s, EPA and DHA is in the regulation of our serotonergic and dopaminergic systems in our brain which, as I mentioned earlier, govern happiness, well-being, pleasure, motivation, and reward. In fact, the largest body of evidence in brain health for the therapeutic role of omega-3 is in ADHD and depression. And this has been confirmed by several meta-analytic reviews, um, including those mentioned for you, showing a small to modest effect size in reducing clinical symptoms of ADHD. A larger effect size has been found in depression and that was published by Hallahan and colleagues in the British Journal of Psychiatry in 2015. And in both cases, EPA rich formulations had the greatest efficacy. Next slide. There are, of course, other brain selective nutrients required for brain health. And some of these includes the vitamins A, C, D, and E, iron, iodine, zinc, magnesium, selenium, choline, the amino acids, uh, tryptophan and 5-HTP, L-thionine, pre and probiotics, as my colleague, Dr. Harlan mentioned earlier. We know that um, there is a bi-directional link between gut health and brain health um, because at least 80% plus of serotonin is made in the gut and then transported by the vagus nerve 
into the brain. Um, brain selective nutrients, if you like, facilitate brain function at both molecular and cellular levels, especially in terms of neurotransmitter function. And essentially to sum up, brain selective nutrients safeguard against um, poor brain health, reducing risk of depression, anxiety, attention deficits, and more. And in fact, nutrition is now considered an epigenetic neuromodulator and overall cognitive enhancer for brain function. Oh, was that it? That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, again, uh, just a really amazing deep dive and we have, we'll have plenty of questions and conversation, I'm sure, at the end. We're going to proceed next with uh, Dr. Kornstadt, please. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Wolfram. So um, just advance to the first slide, please. So after all we heard so far, I mean, it seems that the science is, is, pretty, clear, is pretty clear, right? I mean, we know, well, so less fructose to protect the liver, more soluble fiber to, um, to feed the gut, add more alpha linolenic and EPA DHA acids to support the brain. So the question is, as Subra said earlier, why don't we see all these things in full swing? Why isn't there this um, food system transformation going on right now? And the, the thing is, well, why is it? Wolfram, please. So we ran a survey and um, 500 plus people answered. And they said, well, of course, first thing people look for is tastiness. So that's very important. And of course, people have different preferences. So what do they want and what do they look for in their food? So if they don't buy all the products that should be good for them and have all these facts besides price is that choosing the right thing is so complex. And so there's a lack of transparency there's a fragmentation of all the information. So it's not in one place. You have to get all the things together. And sometimes it's not very reliable. And um, well, of course, the question is, where do you take your, your inputs from? And of course, it can be manufacturers and government. And trust in those is especially low after many of the things that Dr. Lustig mentioned earlier, barking up the wrong tree, the fat, for example. And, uh, but the highest trust is actually in scientific findings. So how does that complexity actually look like? Next slide, please, Wolfram. So, and one more. So if you just say, well, I want to protect my liver, I want to feed my gut, I want to protect my brain. So how do you actually do that if you want to do that in practice? So you break that down in three components. Okay, protect the liver, feed my gut, protect my brain. And then if you really, trying to do that, then you're faced with all these kinds of, of questions to say, okay, so fructose. So you have to learn to identify fructose. And Dr. Lustig, you um, gave a short summary of some um, sugars and so agave syrup and um, all these uh, honey and all these things. So you have to learn where is the fructose actually? Because on the label, it just says, well, that's the amount of sugars on the nutrition facts label, but it doesn't say fructose. So you have to learn about all these things. And then you know, oh, well, sometimes it's not just fructose, it's in the sucrose too, okay? So fructose, sucrose, so you could think, oh, everything with OSE at the end, that's something I have to avoid. And then you suddenly learn about allulose, which is a sugar also, but obviously doesn't have these effects. So this simple OSE ending rule doesn't seem to help you that much. So we identified more than 262 names of sugar, actually, and some of them contain fructose, others don't. And I mean, that's just a challenge on its own, doing all these things. And you're just talking about the sugars. So talking about the, uh, the, uh, the acids, I mean, uh, Rachel, you talked about alpha limonic acid. Well, that's not on the label either. It's just um, unsaturated fatty acids. So you have to learn that. And of course, um, if it's about the dietary fiber, it's getting more and more and more, right? All these things. So it might say even high in ALA on the package, which is good, but just to mask that, well, it's also high in fructose and other things. So this is a very, very complex choice. And Roberta, as you said earlier, you said, well, 
Well, now I know what I have to uh, avoid in my diet, but how do I actually do it? And this is because it's just so complex to do all these things. And most people don't just look for these three things, but say, well, I saw this documentary about the orangutans. And uh, so I want to avoid palm oil, or at least only have certified palm oil, or I want non-GMO cruelty-free. And that just adds more and more and more and more questions you have to answer. And that's the reason, next slide, please, why actually most people say, well, I would like to do something actually, but I give up. This is more than I can actually do when I'm doing my shopping. So even, I mean, if you do it in, the, in your brick and mortar store, if you do it online, sometimes of course, there's not even a green information listed there. So you cannot even uh, tell apart these different things. So the question is, what can we do there? Next slide, please. And so we think that um, the, the main reason or the main things that need to happen actually is that, well, first of all, this complexity has to be reduced because that's actually people are keeping people from doing something because they're just overwhelmed. Trust has to be restored and the people who put this information together, it has to be very easy to use because otherwise it's just nothing you can use in a day-to-day -day shopping situation. And well, none of these things, combinations of things is um, identical for everyone. It's personalized. One person looks for this, another person looks for that. So it has to be personalized. And if these four things are not met, then probably we won't see a change that soon. So our solution to do this is basically a combination of branded filters and a recommendation engine. So the first thing is the branded filter and um, the branding is very important because basically it sums up, so it can be very complex criteria behind that. So it can be any number of criteria, arbitrarily complex, um, but you know, I trust that organization. For example, if Dr. Lustig had to filter, you say, well, I trust what he says. And so I'm just using that filter. And um, so all this complexity just vanishes behind that. You say, well, I just want all these things that I just heard, for example, just a few minutes ago, applied to my food supply. And when you have this kind of branded filter, then you can use it in, an, uh, in a recommendation engine that would apply that filter basically anywhere. So it could be on info sites where you try to get information on food, or um, you can use it in online stores or in apps that you use to whatever, figure out things when you're shopping. And of course, it's not just one branded filter, but of course, it can be any number of branded filters for all the things that are important to you. Next slide, please. So just one example here for the um, HSF filter, because we did one of these for um, the Hypoglycemia Support Foundation, as you know, Roberta, of course. So, I mean, developing this filter has been a very complex endeavor because there's so many things that you actually have to look for. And of course, so far, there used to be a website where all these things were listed. And so we implemented that as a real filter. And you see, well, it's 7,946 ingredients that this filter actually is avoiding. And you can break it down saying, well, okay, nothing with sugars and starches, nothing with grain flours, but nut flours are okay. That's something that confuses people uh, very often the flour, but the filter does it all. Nothing with caffeine. Well, nothing with oils, unless they have been cold pressed. Same with dairy derivatives. Well, you, we don't want those, but if they're whole milk, then that's okay. Um, and so on. So our different uh, levels for uh, sugar, for example, we talked about, well, just look at the label, but well, in general, we would say five grams of sugar per 100 grams, but well, in beverages, just 2.5 grams. But if it's a dairy product, then 10 grams is okay. So it's all this different kinds of criteria based on ingredients, on, uh, on modifiers, fat, non-fat, on, on nutrients, and all these things that you would normally have to think of when you're in front of a shelf or um, doing uh, shopping online, are just encapsulated in that one filter. And you just add it and then boom, you just remove all the things that don't meet filter criteria from your food supply. Next slide, please. So we think that the benefit of this approach is first thing, of course, for consumers, what I just explained, 
it just makes the complexity disappear for the consumer. And finally, the consumer has the feeling that I, as the consumer, I'm back in the driver's seat and I'm not overwhelmed by all this information. So I pick that filter, I trust that person, okay? And now all the things I want to avoid are avoided. Okay, that's, I think that's great on its own already, but of course it's good for food manufacturers too, because if a food, a food manufacturer um, undergoes the process of looking at uh, its own portfolio and you say, well, we meet all these criteria, that means that that manufacturer of course can regain trust saying, well, I mean, there might be all of this, we, I mentioned this front of package, uh, front of package uh, labels, well, but it's not that we try to deceive you with all these sort of package information. We just have plain fact-based filters that apply to this and our product actually makes it. And if the product makes it through all these filters, which are just purely objective and not set by the manufacturer, but set by, for example, Dr. Lustig or the Hyperglycemia Support Foundation, that product stands out on its own because very few products actually make that. And that's, um, one great way, of course, to regain customer trust. And um, of course, if you have products that don't meet these criteria at this point, of course, then at least you have objective criteria that you can uh, aim for and re-engineer your products so they meet these so they meet these criteria. And of course, so that's the one side, that's the consumer side, and that's the manufacturer side. And of course, if you have these things, hopefully, then this will be at least a step to end this um, consumer versus industry antagonism. I mean, Wolfram, you talked about that right at the beginning that you were running around with these um, uh, slogans and uh, boycott this, boycott that, and that we go beyond this and can actually make food system transformation happen, actually. Great. Well, thank you. Um... It really uh, is exciting to see how data, the complexity of all the information that's out there can be uh, transformed into a tool that consumers and industry can use and using the same tool on both sides of the aisle, if you will, on the consumer side and on the industrial side. So um, thank you for your talk and to all of you. Um, this has just been a uh, Fascinating. So I know I have plenty of questions, but we're going to turn to uh, Roberta first because she is our expert consumer um, advocate and has um, uh, been asking the right questions for many years. So Roberta, I imagine as you've been listening, you, you have a few questions that have come up and let's start with you, but then everybody is welcome to join in. I, of course, have my own questions, but let's turn to you first, Roberta. Okay, first to Dr. Harlan, you were talking a lot about the gut and um, I think we're swamped with advertisements about how to heal the gut and that pushing probiotics, prebiotics and now enzymes. So, you know, uh, you mentioned probiotics. Do we add probiotics, prebiotics? Do we take all three? Um, so I would really value your opinion. I think there's some not great evidence right now about exactly what to do with respect to supplements. Um, and, you know, the, it is one of the challenges here in the United States. The supplement industry is essentially unregulated and can sell and claim, make claims about anything in their supplements that they wish. So uh, I think uh, our advice at this stage of the game as physicians, I think in, in, uh, in my role as an internist is we generally don't recommend many supplements in general. And certainly there's not a lot of great evidence about supplementation with probiotics at this point. Um, when you say prebiotics, you know, what you really, what, what, what we really mean by prebiotics are exactly what we've been talking about, whole foods. Uh, fiber rich foods that have not had all the goodness uh, kind of stripped away from them, the bran, et cetera. Uh, whether that is in, you know, wheat products, uh, whether that's in other highly processed grains, 
Um, so, you know, that's really what we mean when we say prebiotic more than anything else. In short, I think the, the real answer is food that is as close to whole or as close to its original state is what is the best for our gut. And so really the solution becomes about delivering, as I mentioned earlier, great quality food and great quality ingredients because they just happen to be really great for us. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Wolfram, can I ask another question? Please, please do. Um, Dr. Gao, I'm so thrilled that you're here today. Um, I was reading your book and it, it, it touched a lot, especially since we have been receiving in the last 10 or 15 years so many uh, cries for help for children four, five, six, seven, eight years old that have severe hypoglycemia and ADHD. And these parents are looking for us for answers. And, you know, we're not really equipped and we shouldn't be equipped. But I was wondering, children that are six, seven, and eight year olds, they're not even looking at the fact that they were diagnosed with hypoglycemia or have a blood sugar problem. They're looking first at the ADHD and they're immediately uh, prescribing Adderall. What's happening here? I mean, what do we tell them? How do we guide them? What do they ask that doctor? I mean, do they just take it willingly or acceptingly and say, okay, I have to give my child, you know, Adderall starting at eight years old? Yeah, I mean, it's a very common phenomenon that also happens uh, here in the UK. And there's uh, a growing desire in the field that I work in, for example, nutritional psychiatry, is that when a child presents at their general practitioner or pediatrician with um, problematic behavior, that simultaneously they should be referred to a dietitian or a nutritionist um, for nutrient testing. So, you know, either by way of a blood draw to look at nutritional insufficiencies in key nutrients, which facilitate neurotransmitter function. And as I mentioned earlier, regulate, you know, the, horma the hormones and neurotransmitters that make us feel happy. Um, gut health is critical as well. A lot of children that I work with that have ADHD and autism have a wide range of nutritional insufficiencies, um, which will very likely impact their brain function and behavior. And simultaneously, they present with food intolerances and food allergies. Oftentimes, these children can be picky eaters. So they gravitate towards what we call the beige foods or the white foods. So like white refined pasta, white rice, white potatoes, chicken nuggets, and they will habitually be consuming these types of foods which are devoid of any um, nutrients, you know, so their brains become nutritionally impoverished. So I think number one, um, in, the, in the UK, general practitioners only have about two hours of nutritional training. So that's one area that we're going wrong. We need to better educate our, you know, medical doctors as students that what you eat does also affect the body and, uh, sorry, affect the brain and not just the body, because of course the brain is an organ that needs feeding, you know, it needs nourishment to work optimally, but it's a real shame. We need to move beyond the prescription pad and look at um, personalized nutrition. So look at a personalized approach and um, certainly, as Professor Robert Listig always says, start with the diet. You know, try fixing the diet first. If you can fix the diet, if you can't fix the diet or it has no impact on that child's, you know, behavior profile, then of course, you know, potentially explore other options. But yeah, we need to move beyond the prescription pad. Just to follow up on your uh, comments, Dr. Gao, um, you know, the average parent just doesn't know what questions to ask. And I'm, I'm going to 
take a shortcut and say, you probably discussed this in your book, how to help parents to ask the right questions. Could you say, well, I will post links to all of your work and your websites afterwards, but what is the name of your book so people can uh, hopefully find these uh, answers and questions that sh they should be asking? Sure, it's called Smart Foods for ADHD and Brain Health. Great. So well, thank you. Amazon yeah. and Jessica Kingsley Publishers website. Great. Thank I would you. like to add, I would like to add, Wolfram, that it's not, you know, I think that a lot of the perception is that it's all or none. And, you know, um, I, I have, you know, patients who come in and they have hypertension, for example, uh, like they might have ADHD as kids. And there are genetic causes for both of those, uh, both of those conditions. But the fact of the matter is that when, you know, in our hypertensive patients uh, and our patients who are at higher risk for heart disease, et cetera, even if we completely, you know, even if they completely change their diets and are eating perfectly and exercising, they may still have high blood pressure. They may still need medication. And, and, but the fact of the matter is that with heart disease, for example, the medication and the healthier diet and healthier lifestyle are synergistic. One plus one equals about 2.6. So, you know, I don't, you know, I don't want people to misinterpret that this is all or none, you know, good quality medicine is still really good quality medicine, but this is another piece of the toolbox that we are working on implementing uh, in our medical schools, our residency programs uh, here in the United States now. Thanks yeah, for pointing that out. Um, Dr. Gao? No, I was just going to say, I absolutely support what um, Dr. Harlan said. Um, I'm, I was just referring to, to children as young as six and seven. Yeah. Essentially. Of course, medications are life-saving. No one's disputing that. Yeah. Well, the, the problem is that some medications lose their efficacy because of their diet. As an example, uh, a study many, many years ago, uh, when metformin first appeared back in 1994, giving metformin to insulin resistant children. And what we saw was that metformin had a very significant effect on improving insulin sensitivity and promoting weight loss, except if they were high sugar consumers. And in fact, the amount of sugar that they consumed negated the effect of the metformin. And now we know why, because sugar inhibits the enzyme AMP kinase that metformin actually stimulates. So ultimately medication has to be looked at as an adjunct to, uh, 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 you know, appropriate and rational therapy rather than as the primary tool. And ultimately you can sabotage yourself by eating a problematic, metabolically unhealthy diet. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lessig. And a follow up on the sugar question, you know, sugar is the, the gorilla in the room. Um, how do we get off sugar? I mean, uh, we know that for consumers, many of us have been addicted to sugar and the industry is addicted to sugar, maybe because consumers are addicted to sugar, but also because, you know, putting sugar into a product almost guarantees that it sells. It's very hard to walk away from, um, you know, from that. So both on the consumer side and the industry side, you know, how do we get off the sugar? How do we reduce the sugar? I mean, uh, I think people, they, they hear that and they, they sort of uh, know that sugar is an issue, but then, uh, you know, walking away from sugar is not an easy, uh, not easy steps. No, it isn't. I agree with that. Uh, the fact of the matter is that a lot of people still don't know. Uh, more people do know today than did seven years ago. And in fact, the International Food Information Council uh, asked this question in 2011 and then again in 2018, what specific food or foodstuff causes the most weight gain? And in 2011, only 11% of the respondents figured um, uh, refined carbohydrate and sugar. Most said a calorie is a calorie, or I don't know. 
That number went up to 42% in 2018 with the people saying, I, I don't know, or calories a calorie going down commensurately. So more people are aware, but having said that, we have this sugar addiction problem. Now, people say that sugar is not addictive and how could a food be addictive? In fact, the question is, is sugar a food? The definition of food is a substrate that contributes to growth or burning of an organism. The fact of the matter is that sugar inhibits growth because of its effects on insulin resistance, and sugar inhibits burning through its effects on mitochondria. So in fact, sugar is not a food. Sugar is a food additive. Now, when the food industry understands that, perhaps you know, there will be some movement and some traction within the industry itself. But as you said, the food industry is addicted to it. And the reason is because they learned early on when they add it, you buy more. And that is especially true in children. And the reason is because of this addictive component, because it lights up the reward center of the brain, the nucleus accumbens. So the question is, how do you undo that? How do you fix that? Well, one thing we've learned is that the dose matters, the chronicity matters. And so the fact that 67% of the sugar in children's diets is in ultra processed food tells you something about that category of food and in terms of what needs to happen. So ultra processed food is the target of metabolic health. It is the target that we need to address. And it's the target, of course, that the food industry is most dependent on because it is their highest profit margin. So what we need in order to be able to do this rationally is a new food business model where the food industry is rewarded for doing the right thing instead of doing the wrong thing. Now, what can individual people do? Well, we start with education. That is what we're doing right now. Ultimately, we have to make better food available. And KDD is to be congratulated for you know, broaching this subject and attempting to do so and doing it for all altruistic and you know, uh, important uh, uh, societal reasons uh, because they recognize the, uh, the, the import and the fact that, you know, healthcare will collapse under its own weight if we don't do it. Um, individuals, uh, you know, need to understand how to cook. All right. And, you know, today in today's day and age, um, you know, uh, more than 33% of Americans do not know how to cook. And if you don't know how to cook, you're hostage to the food industry for the rest of your life. So these are things that happen at the individual level. But then what has to happen at the societal level? Well, I people ask me all the time, if you had a magic wand, what would you do? And the, the, the single most important thing that I think would make the biggest change all at once would be to get rid of all food subsidies. Because food subsidies distort the market. And they have distorted the market. And that is one of the reasons why ultra processed food is cheap. In fact, it turns out not to be cheap. It actually turns out to be very expensive when you take into account the healthcare and societal costs. And the paper just came out just this past week from the uh, Harvard and Tufts group showing how many people's lives and how much money we would save if we got sugar down. We had done the same in 2017. So this is where I think the rubber hits the road. This is why metabolic health is currently uh, constrained is because of our current food business model. This needs to be rethought and who better to do that than the UN Food Systems Summit? Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Lessig. I mean, you really brought it home and there's, we could uh, actually spend probably a couple of more hours if we were to really dig in deep to each of the talks that you gave. But I'd like to close with this final um, you know, topic. 
which is this metabolic matrix itself. And um, the interesting, a uh, couple of interesting things about how KDD is approaching this. Uh, there's an internal process uh, that KDD has ongoing uh, to, to work with this matrix. Um, but right from the beginning of the process, KDD also has been sharing this model, this matrix concept um, globally with other food and beverage companies. And I'm going to let Subra uh, speak to this. But my, my understanding is the idea is that all ships rise with the tide, that no one company can solve this alone. And while each company may have its own particular uh, criteria, these principles of uh, support the brain, protect the liver, feed the gut can be applied, can be scaled, can be um, uh, uh, replicated um, at any company. Um, Subra, I mean, uh, would you just offer uh, one comment? Like, uh, just curious that, you know, the fact that Katie has been willing to share this uh, concept right from the beginning, uh, which I think is remarkable because usually companies that go through uh, what might be called reformulation or trying to reduce sugar. Sugar. This goes on very quietly behind the scenes, and uh, KDD has been very proactive in sharing um, its the progress that it's making in this area. Yeah, sure, Wolfram. For us, it has been a tremendous process of transformation in our own thinking, and I think the most important aspect there is the willingness to embrace science and. This had been a problem for us because we sell a lot of fruit juice, 100% fruit juice. And the thinking always has been to anyone who spoke to us and said, why do you sell uh, beverages? We say, no, we sell 100% fruit juices. The amount of sugar added beverages that we sell is very small. It's a small fraction of the total amount of beverages that we sell. But this new thinking about fructose and the impact it has on the liver and the entire system has really opened up our mind. And we are definitely going to make changes internally in KDD, but KDD is a small fish in this whole sea. KDD alone cannot make the difference. Since we are so convinced about the science that is behind this, behind, behind protecting the liver, feeding the gut and supporting the brain, we want it to be amplified. We want to find suitable organizations which can scale this up. This is for universal good. It's not just for the good of KDD or for the people in our society or the population around us. It's for everybody's betterment. And which is why we're trying to work with the World Economic Forum, with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Whoever else is willing to listen, accept this concept, amplify it, give it the necessary you know, scope, to grow. Well, thank you. And that there is the gauntlet on the table and the invitation to uh, all the people that are listening, uh, both the consumers, because we have a consumer advocacy organization here, the Hypoglycemia Support Foundation, and to industry in the food and beverage industry. Um, th there is an active interest in this uh, collaboration to um, in, encourage participation from others. This is why uh, this is being shared on the United Nations Food Systems Summit uh, website. And there's been many conversations behind the scenes with the uh, organizations that Subra mentioned, the World Economic Forum, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, uh, to um, uh, just dig deeper in this conversation, to broaden the collaboration, uh, to form, uh, you know, what we're calling a metabolic alliance to connect the dots between metabolic health and nutrition and food. And there's an evidence base and a database, uh, as Dr. Kornstadt pointed out. So there's actually significant structure between this effort. It's not just another uh, diet or philosophy. This is science-based and evidence-based. So I want to congratulate you all and thank you. Um, I, as I mentioned, I think we could spend uh, at least a couple more hours digging into the science here, but um, we've already been going on now for um, an hour and a half at least. And so we'll respect our viewers' time and your time, and thank you. And please, uh, if you have any closing comments, um, uh, please offer them now.
Thank right, you, Wolf. I just say one thing, Wolf. Yes. I think Thank if you. this finds, if this conversation, if this dialogue finds its place in the United Nations, United Nations Food Systems Summit, and if it gains traction there, if like-minded people adopt it and give it the necessary impetus, that would be a great job done. Thank you. Anyone else before we close? I just want to say see. thank you. Thank you to everyone who's been committed, who's been dedicated to work so hard and um, it's going to happen. It will. This is a start. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all for joining thank us you. today. Thank all you. right. Thank you very much.